Okay, just a couple of quick things before we get started. Um, so for next time, you're going to be reading the excerpt from Carlisle and the excerpt from Engels. Both of them are in volume E, right? So we're going to be sticking with that. Um, and then we'll be back on the syllabus as normal, right? We'll have, we'll have caught up to where we should be. Um, <clears throat> so you'll be reading the Zadie Smith and the John Cooper Clark poem for Monday. And the, the John Cooper Clark poem isn't in the anthology. I'll give that to you. Um, you're also going to be doing timeline submissions for next time, right? So they're going to have to do with work and industrialization between 1835 and 1901, right? So that's the subject and the period you're going to be focused on. Um, I also do want to give everybody the opportunity to revise the midterm paper if you want a better grade. So um, midterm grades are posted. Everybody's seen them, right? And you know, nobody is in any trouble here. Right? Everybody's doing fine. Um, but if you want to up that score a little bit, right, go to Georgia View, read the feedback, and revise, right? And remember that revise doesn't mean edit, right? It doesn't mean fix a citation or a spelling mistake here and there. It means actually rethinking and rewriting the paper. And I'm happy to work with you on this, um, or I'm happy to help you if you want it. Um, you can also make an appointment at the Writing Center and get help there. Um, just make sure you bring the assignment with you and also, you know, my feedback so they can help you tailor it. Um, so you can improve your score by up to one full letter grade, right? Now, how much improvement is going to depend on how much the paper is improved, right? The worst thing that will happen is that, you know, like, say all you do is a couple of little edits of spelling mistakes, right? No points for that. But I guarantee that no one will lose points for doing this, even if you do manage to make the paper worse, which has happened but doesn't happen very often. So I, I do just like to note that, right, there's, the, you know, the biggest risk for you is basically if you don't put anything into this, then you get no points, right? But if you actually make a sincere attempt, you will at least get some points. And this is going to be, I keep forgetting to put the due date up for this. So I did the same thing in my uh, fancy class this afternoon. This will be due October 29th, right? So not this coming Friday, but the following Friday. Okay, so any questions about this? Going once, going twice. I try to be. But we can ask you questions if we are not understanding, right? Oh, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you don't understand some part of my feedback, uh -huh. or if you want me to look over something before you turn it in, yeah, absolutely. Please ask me about it. Okay. Yeah, happy to. I'm happy to sit down and talk it through with you. Okay. So, today we're looking at a pretty familiar story, right? One that is pretty culturally pervasive. Um, you know, it, it tends to be aired in dozens of different versions around the holiday season, right? Mm -hmm. So, when reading this, was there anything about it that surprised you? Given how broadly broadly familiar this material is. Was there anything in here that you didn't expect or that made you think, like, hmm, that's not the way I remember it, or any such thing? Well, I mean, I guess I didn't really know what Bob Humbug meant. Okay. Not really, but like I've heard it a million times, but uh -huh. I didn't really know what that meant. Okay. Until reading it. It was just screwed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and let's look at the personality of this character. Um, over his shoulder. We're looking through the whole 
narrative. So let's start in stave one here, remember because this is a Christmas carol, right? Right, a carol being a kind of folk song. Instead of chapters, we have staves, as though it's music, right? So, <clears throat> if we look at the very beginning of stave one here, page 264, do we even start with Scrooge? We start with Marley, yes. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. So why is it so necessary at the beginning here, at the very beginning, to establish this particular fact? Because I don't think Scrooge would believe any of it if it had to start with Marley. Okay. Yeah, all of this kind of begins with Marley, right? And <clears throat> what this is doing is setting us up for Marley's appearance later on, right, as a ghost. Um, it's kind of, it works kind of the same way as the first scene um, in Hamlet does. Like, have, did, have any of you all read, um, read or seen Hamlet? Are you familiar with Hamlet? A little bit? Okay, so yeah, there's the first scene where Hamlet himself isn't present, right? It's just the guards and his friend Horatio who see the ghost walking around on the battlements, right, of the castle. And that scene exists to establish the existence of the ghost, right? So that when Hamlet sees the ghost, right, we don't think he's hallucinating. So it's about proving the material reality of the ghost. Or at least making the materiality of the material reality of the ghost more plausible, right? Indeed, like you know, the thing that you know, the sentence that ends the paragraph is old Marley was as dead as a doornail as dead as a physical object that does not move, right? Now, if we move a little bit further on to when the ghost actually appears, Turn to page 273. Can I get somebody to read for us, starting from, you don't believe in me, observe the ghost? About the middle of the page. You don't believe in me, observe the ghost? I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheese. You may be under the digest a bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of other done potato. There's more gravy than a gravy about you, whatever you want. Okay, thank you. So when the ghost appears to him, what does Scrooge think must be happening? Yeah, and what's causing the hallucination? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, I, 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 I don't know about you, but I've never had hallucinations caused by indigestion. But, <laughs> but yeah, like what Scrooge is doing here is insisting 
that this vision before him must have some kind of material cause, right? So we see in Scrooge, generally speaking up to this point, a kind of denial of anything supernatural. And a kind of philosophical materialism, right? He's not just materialistic in that he's selfish and grasping, right? He is also materialist in that he doesn't seem to believe in anything that doesn't have some sort of material cause, right? Hence, this vision of his dead friend and business partner must be attributable to some kind of material cause, right? So then how is Marley able to prove to Scrooge his existence? So he has to prove that he is, in some sense, material, right? That, you know, that the, <clears throat> the parts of him are all wired together or something, right? So yeah, the, uh, the, the, removing the bandage proves to Scrooge Marley's materiality, right? And scares the crap out of him. But more importantly, it's just, okay, like, like you know, this ghost responds to certain stimuli, right? And is, held together in these various pieces. Right? It's not just a hallucination. It's not just a vision here, right? And I think it's important that it's Marley here as well. If we look at, back at the beginning, the way Scrooge um, identifies himself, right, or responds to uh, people who are new to the business. Can I get somebody to read, starting with Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name? Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people knew new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Okay, thank you. So what does this tell us about Scrooge's sense of identity? Yeah, he doesn't care if you call him Scrooge or Marley, right? And why not? What does he identify himself with? He's with Marley. Okay. Yeah, with Marley, right? With his business partner, right? And more importantly, what's the name of their firm? Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge and Marley, right? Yeah, so he identifies himself with the business, right? Not as a person separate from the business. Mm -hmm. which I think you know, leads us to um, the quote that I always like to hurl at my more capitalist friends on page 275, right? But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. So the Scrooge's definition of business here is being pointed out as kind of too narrow, right? And associated only with his profession. That 
<clears throat> what Marley is pointing out here is that the common business of all human beings is the welfare of other human beings, right? Not uh, the making of profits for oneself. And this is all um, very much a response to particular historical pressures, right? So this novella was published in 1843. In the midst of a moment in British history known as the Hungry Forties. So throughout the 1840s, for a variety of reasons, Britain experienced a severe economic depression. It started with defaults on debts that US states owed to British banks. Right, so you know, various you know, American states had borrowed money from British banks and weren't able to pay it back. This is why uh, Dickens makes a few jokes in this novella about uh, US securities being unreliable. There's also a trade slump, high unemployment, and to top it all off, a few years with bad harvests. So trade is suffering, people can't find work, there isn't enough food to go around, and a protectionist set of laws known as the Corn Laws. prevents Britain from importing food cheaply. Right, so essentially these corn laws placed enormous taxes on imported cereal grains. So wheat, oats, barley, anything like that, right? Now they were intended to prop up the price of native British grains, right? To make the sale of these more profitable for uh, British farmers. However, in a time of economic crisis, it made it a lot harder and more expensive to bring in food to feed starving people, right? So practically speaking, what these corn laws did was limit purchasing of any grain products to native-grown British grains, right? And the government, even as, you know, this depression was, um, and was getting underway, didn't act fast enough to repeal these. So, you know, by 1846, um, there's already been a devastating economic effect from this, right? Added to this, you have a potato blight in Ireland and Scotland. Now this is a staple crop that the Irish and the Scots relied heavily upon. And so this leads to mass emigration from both Ireland and Scotland, right? Some of them coming to England, others going to Australia, or to Canada or to the United States. So Ireland and Scotland start kind of emptying out. In fact, like, you know, this particular moment in history is still known um, to the Irish as the potato famine or the Great Hunger. 
and there's a lot of animosity uh, towards the British laissez-faire economic policy, or let's just leave things as they are, um, that prevented people from getting enough food during this period, right? So how this connects to A Christmas Carol, right? How this connects to Dickens? Like a lot of governments, the way Parliament responded to this economic crisis was with a series of what we call austerity measures. Do you know what austerity means in economics? Okay, so basically what austerity means is the government cuts back on spending. It's pretty similar to what we did in uh, you know, 2008 when uh, we had our last big recession, right? Um, governments across the world basically just stopped spending money. This is usually the favorite response to crisis of conservative economists, most of whom want to cut state spending anyway. Leftist and center-left economists tend to argue that you actually stimulate the economy more if the government keeps spending money because the government is a massive buyer of goods and services. And if private individuals are feeling squeezed and aren't spending money, somebody has to keep the, you know, somebody has to keep the wheels turning. So Dickens is closer to that latter camp, right? So he has the protagonist of this particular story be known primarily as a miser, right? Like that seems to be like a Scrooge's chief characteristic, right? Apart from the fact that he identifies himself solely with his business and not with any, you know, fam not according to family ties, not according to social connections. Um, doesn't seem to have any life outside of his work, right? He didn't want to pay his employee for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to pay the food. He doesn't want to pay Yeah, you know, it's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every December 25th. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he, yeah um, th that's another I want to get to in a second, right? The way he tends to conflate time and money, right? which actually speaks to some things that we were talking about last time. Um, but uh, where was I going with this? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, so um, you know, um, he's, he's, a, yeah, he's a solitary miser, right? I think, yeah, we need to stress Scrooge's solitary nature here as well. Um, and I just want to point to a passage um, about two paragraphs on pages 292 and 293 when Scrooge is traveling with the ghost of Christmas present. Can I get somebody to start reading for us from, for the people who are shoveling away on the housetops? And I'll just tell you what's up. Last paragraph on page 292. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the fair face and now and then exchanging a false facetious facetious <laughs> snowball better natured this so far than many a wordy jest laughing heartily if it were right and not less heartily if it were wrong the poulterers shops were still half open and the fruiterers <laughs> yep. were radiant in their glory there were great round pot belly baskets of chestnuts shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the 
doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic mm -hmm. oh. opulence. Mm -hmm. There were ruddy, brown faced, broad girths, Spanish onions, shining in the fat, fatness of their growth in the Spanish friars and winking from their shells and wonton slyness at the girls and they as they went by and glanced demurely at the hung up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeepers and the benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks mm -hmm. that people's mouths might water gratis mm -hmm. as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance. Ancient, ancient walks along the woods and pleasant shuffling ankles deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squab, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow in, of the orange lemons and in the great co compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. Okay, we can stop here, right? So, what's going on here? What is being described here? Sounds like a market. Okay, yeah, it's a market, right? And what is the focus here on? Food. Yeah, the food, right? The fruits, the poultry, right? The onions, you know, vegetables, right? And why do you think why do you think he's spending so much time describing all of this food in this market? Does this seem to be part of a pattern in the whole novella? He spends a lot of time describing food layouts, right? Yeah. He's doing it yeah, he's doing it on the next page as well, right? He does it when the ghost of Christmas present first appears, right? Fezziwig's party, there's a good um, long description about the, uh, you know, the table that's laid out, right? And note here, too, that he says, you know, the shopkeepers, you know, hung the, you know, in the shopkeeper's benevolence, right, to dangle from conspicuous hooks, these bunches of grapes, that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed, right? So, you know, the pe people's, pe people's mouths can water for free, right? But are the grapes free? There's all of this good stuff available for purchase, right? Mm -hmm. And as the shopkeepers are trying to make the customers' mouths water by dangling these grapes, right? Dickens is trying to do the same thing to the reader by describing all of this food so that you will go out and buy shit. <laughs> now, like, like, so yeah, like in some ways, right, like this novella is an ad, you know, it, it's, it's not an advertisement for any specific thing, but it is exhorting you to go out and spend money on Christmas, right? The idea being, that this is the only way to unlock the economy, right? To get things moving again. If we go to the, to the Ghost of Christmas Past narrative, and the party at Old Fezziwigs, on page 285, right? The Ghost of Christmas Past says to Scrooge, right? A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig. And when he had done so, said, why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? So three or four pounds, right, by the way, like translates to about 450 to $500 in, you know, 1843 British money. It isn't that," said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not the latter, not his latter self. 
It isn't that spirit. He has the pleasure to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is as great as if it cost a fortune. So what does Fezziwig accomplish by spending about 500 bucks on a Christmas party? Happy. Yeah. He makes his employees and his neighbors happy, right? So you know, the idea here being that spending a little money can buy happiness not just for you, but for other people, right? So you know, a lot of you know, mo most of the spending is happening in some kind of social context. Now we can compare this to Marley and to the other ghosts around him in stage one, right? And what are all of those ghosts carrying with them? Marley and his friends all have connected to their chains. You get an example on page 276 near the bottom, right? And we can actually see the illustration uh, next to this. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was, clearly, that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. So what is this ghost literally about weighing it down? Mm -hmm. Literally, not figuratively. Yeah, it's got an iron safe attached to its ankle, right? And they're all, they've all got locked cash boxes on their chains, right? And this is meant as a kind of allegory for greed or stinginess, right? You know, they've literally taken boxes, like locked boxes full of cash with them into the afterlife, where it does no one any good. Right. So you can't take it with you, but once you do, you can't spend it. And all of the representations of the ghosts are in some way um, allegorical, right? They're, they're all intended to um, symbolize something in particular about what that ghost represents. So let's take a minute and take the descriptions of the ghosts apart. We'll start with Christmas past. So can I get somebody to read for us the first two paragraphs on page 279? He was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view, and being diminished to a child's proportions. 
Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same as if it holds, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were like those upper members bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hands, and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strange thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light by which all this was visible and which was doubtless the occasion of seizing in its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap which it now had which it now held under its arms okay let's stop there for a minute and then i want to come to that second paragraph again because there's something important going on there as well but what do we notice about the description of the what seems important here about the ghost's appearance what seems potentially symbolic and symbolic of what Okay. It looks like a child and what else? An old man. Yeah. Now think about why this might be logical in a being that's supposed to represent the past. Where do you stand in relation to your own past? Yeah, you were younger then, but it's also a long time ago, right? Hence, youth and age combined here, right? You're remembering your younger self, but from a distance. Right, you know, hence, you know, the <clears throat> appearance of having receded from view and been diminished to a child's proportions, right? Because we always look at the, we, we can only look at the past from far away. What else? What about the, the arms? The arms were very long and muscular. The hands, the same as if its hold, were, un, were of uncommon strength. Yeah. Why might the past be represented as having very strong arms with a, with a with a strong hold. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's always got a grip on you, right? It holds a branch of fresh green holly in its hand. What does holly tend to represent symbolically? Well, what do we know about holly as a plant? When does it bloom? Do we not know anything about the holly plants? It's the, you know, the, like the, 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 the red berries and the sharp green leaves. Oh, those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know what it is, I just don't know what uh -huh. about. Okay, well, yeah, it's, it's an evergreen. It blooms in the winter, right? I was going to guess in the winter only because of it being a Christmas plant. Yeah, and yeah, in right, right, right context, right? Yeah, but I wasn't sure still, you know. Uh-huh, yeah. Like, you know, like, like it's, it's okay to venture a guess even if it's wrong, but I'm not going to make fun of you. Yeah. <laughs> the worst thing I'll do is correct you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, so you know, what, what we've got here, right, is, you know, life in, you know, Greenery in winter, right? You know, life in a season of death. So a little kind of like, like promise of immortality kind of thing. And then it's got the light on its brow. And the, the candle cap, right? The extinguisher. So on the one hand, this relates 
this being specifically to the candle by Scrooge's bed, right? Just as the ghost of Christmas, Christmas yet to come kind of fades into a bedpost when Scrooge wakes up. So it does connect these ghosts to material things in his bedroom, right? Though by the end of this, he's no longer giving them solely material uh, um, explanations. But, <clears throat> right, the light of the past, right, is, you know, the illumination and knowledge we get. thinking about the past, or from thinking on the past. And the extinguisher is the way we try to suppress our memories, right? When they become painful or too much to bear. Right, just as Scrooge, when he's reminded of his last meeting with his, with his former fiance, grabs the extinguisher from the ghost and plops it down on its head, right? because he doesn't want to remember anymore. But the thing that's going on primarily in the past episode here, right? let's like think about the primary episodes here, right? So we start in the past with Scrooge as a schoolboy, right? left alone when all of his friends have gone home for Christmas. And we can see that at least at the time he was an imaginative schoolboy, right? You know, he has, you know, he has, you know, visits from characters in books that he's read. We follow that with Scrooge's apprentice to Fezziwig. That then followed by Scrooge as businessman ending his relationship with his fiance, right? So why do you think Scrooge needs to go through these past Christmases? Why does he need to be shown his past by the ghost in order to be reformed? Because he sees where he went wrong. Okay, yeah, you can see where his, you can see specifically where his direction changed, right? Where his trajectory got messed up. But note, too, like what do all of the episodes in this section have in common? Who is the central character and who's the central the central actor in each of these? That makes it different from what he does with the ghost of Christmas present and the ghost of Christmas the Christmas yet to come. He? Yeah, he is, right? This is the only ghost that really shows him much of himself directly, right? So if Scrooge is to develop sympathy with other people, he first has to learn to sympathize with his past self, right? And I would argue that seeing himself as a schoolboy, for example, and remembering those lonely Christmases increases his sympathy for Tiny Tim when he visits the Cratchits, right? And sees, you know, this, you know, sickly boy sitting by the fire with his crutch, right? And being reminded of how fragile his sister was, right? He has to be able to connect other people to himself in order to feel sympathy, right? He has to reimagine what those things felt like. Now let's look at the Christmas present episode. And how is this episode 
spe uh, specifically different from the other two. So we already mentioned that Scrooge is the central actor in the drama of the past, right? And in the yet to come portion, he is the presence that runs through all of it, right? But in the present, which is the portion of time that Scrooge lives in entirely at the beginning of the, the novella, right? In the present, what's just about the only place they don't visit? Or just about the only person they don't check in on? Yeah, the present is all about other people, right? Now, what might be one practical reason why they don't check on check in on him at He's Christmas present? Here, but <laughs> well, also, what do we know about Scrooge and what he does on Christmas? He's selfish. He did. He spends time alone. Yeah, there'd be nothing to see, right? From what it seemed like, he probably sleeps. <laughs> I mean, that's what it seemed like he would be doing. Uh huh. Well, I'm not sure he would because of this equation that he makes between time and money, right? Yeah. And remember again that in the early 1840s, this idea, is the, the idea you know, that time is money is still a relatively new thing, right? The idea of people being paid hourly wages, of you know, dividing up shifts in a factory by hours, uh, railroad time timetables, time all this stuff is still pretty new. Christmas, as Christmas, you just see it as a normal working. Right. Day. Christmas is a humbug. Yes. Yeah. Who cares if no one else is working? Right? Yeah. If, if, you know, if, they, if they checked in on him, they just find him in his counting house, right? Letting the coins clink against each other. Now, let's look at the description of the ghost of Christmas present on page 290. Right. Can I get somebody to read um, from, I am the ghost of Christmas presence of the spirit, look upon me. I am the ghost of Christmas presence of the spirit, look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. His garment hung so loosely on the figure that his cap capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by an artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath that here and there was shining as close. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eyes, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no soil was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. Okay, thank you. So, I think. The biggest things to note here in this description are the bare breast, the open hand, and the rusty scabbard. So it more or less tells us what the spirit's bare breast is supposed to represent, right? What is, what, why does the spirit have his chest exposed? What, what is that supposed to mean? Yes, yeah, disdaining to be watered or concealed by any artifice, right? What's artifice? It's not clothing, no, although making clothing might be a form of artifice. So artifice typically means like you know, craft, right? But it can also mean um, artificial behavior, right? Like deceit. So, if the spirit disdains any artifice, then what does the bare breast mean? What does that mean about the spirit and the values he represents? He's vain. Eh, maybe not vain. I remember this is a Christmas ghost, right? Yeah. These are like artificial. Yeah. He's supposed to be. It's supposed to represent honesty. 
right? Open. No, di open. yeah, exactly. Open, no disguise, no hiding, right? The open hand should be easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying. Yeah. Generosity, right? And then the rusty scabbard is maybe a little bit more obscure, right? It's amp so he's got a scabbard, right? A scabbard is supposed to hold a sword, but there's no sword in it. It's empty, and it's rusted over. So think about the kinds of things a sword would represent. What would a sword represent, typically? Warrior? Yeah, violence and warfare, right? Mm -hmm. So if his scabbard is rusty and there's no sword in it, yeah, the rusty scabbard represents peace, right? This is a season of peace. And when we get to the last of the ghosts, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. What's that? Yeah, he looks very Grim reaper -y, right? It's the shortest description of any of the ghosts on page 305, right? The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night, and separated from the darkness by which it was surrounded. So again, think about what this ghost represents and how that might be connected to you know, the fact that it's just like a, just a shape in a dark cloak. Dead and you need to get your life together before it's too late. Okay. Yeah. Although, like, one thing to note, too, it, ne it doesn't point out when Scrooge is going to die, right? Neither we nor he actually know how long it's going to be before the words on that tombstone come to pass, right? In fact, it's probably the only thing the ghost shows him that's absolutely inevitable. Or, well, the reason that he's going to die, right? Well, he's going to die around this. Yeah, ex ex exa exactly, right? So, yeah, so that, that's, it's, it, it's always kind of funny to me that, like, that's the thing that kind of, like, moves him and frightens him the most at the end, right? Because that's... Nobody's going to remember you. But, it, but it, aren't they warning him that he's going to be stuck like they are if he doesn't change? That's what the, yeah, the phantoms at the beginning are warning him about. Or Marley is warning him yeah, that, that he yeah. will wander like them. So yeah, so you know, the idea of death without the chance of reforming first. But the point I'm trying to make is that like Scrooge doesn't know how far in the future this is, right? Yeah. You know, he doesn't know whether this is tomorrow, you know, tomorrow, like, or whether this is next Christmas or six to eight years from then or whatever, right? So <clears throat> what the ghost of Christmas yet to come is doing like, they're all playing with time, right? Mm -hmm. But we see a technique at work here called prolepsis. And prolepsis, in a literary text, is a flash forward in time. just reforming Scrooge's attitude towards a particular season of the year, a particular holiday, right? What they're doing is reforming his attitude towards time. Right? Remember that this is all artificially compressed into a single night, right?
And indeed, for the first two ghosts, for their visits, he's kind of obsessed with the clock. But that's gone away by the time the third ghost comes. Because the third ghost just comes when the second disappears. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, he's dealing with an artificially compressed time scale. Um, and he's experienced past, present, and future in a single night, right? So he's gone backwards into his own past to remember what he used to be. So working on himself there, right? In the present, he has wandered the world with the ghost to put him back into touch with other people. And the ghost of Christmas yet to come is preparing him for the idea of a world in which he no longer exists, right? What will things be like for you when you're gone? What will things be like when you're gone? Will people care when you're gone? Will anyone remember you? Or will your servants steal your stuff? Um, and the business associates you respected, you know, laugh about your funeral, right? So, <clears throat> this is why he needs to learn to live in three different notions of time at once, right? To be able to bring these ideas together in order to live well in the present. And in order to kind of to unlock that cash box and, so, I mean, and like everything he does in the last stave of the story is about spending money, right? He gives generously to charity. He buys the turkey, buys the, the prize turkey for the Cratchits. Um, he gives Bob a raise, right? Just about everything he does is related to the spending of money. And all of these ideas in 1843 could have been yours in a lavishly illustrated gift book for the low, low price of five shillings or about 35 bucks. <laughs> and now this was actually, in terms of these gift books, right, which this was definitely designed to be, this was actually priced lower than most and well within the means of the average middle class person, right? So the audience he's aiming for is not the rich, right? He's not looking for, you know, wealthy lord such and stuff, such to uh, unlock his purse and start spending for Christmas. He's looking for your average small businessman, somebody who runs a private independent concern like Mr. Scrooge, right? And aiming squarely at them. to try to get them to spend their way out of the hungry 40s. Okay, so um, since we started a little early, we're running uh, about to the end of our time. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, so remember for next time, right, um, I had more stuff on the syllabus, but I decided to pare it back to just the Carlisle and the angles. So let me give you the guide questions for that, and then we'll let you go.